Chapter 10 of Danger in Deep Space This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Danger in Deep Space by Kerry Rockwell Narrated by Sam Holloway Chapter 10 Can I speak with you a minute, Spaceman? Roger turned from the automatic food dispenser and stared at a wizened little man standing beside him, grinning up at him toothlessly. What do you want? asked Roger. Just talk. Let's sit down at this table, eh? said the little man, taking the cadet by the arm. Got a little deal I think you might be interested in. Roger cast a quick appraising glance over the shabbily dressed man and walked to the table. Unless someone knew Roger personally, it would have been hard to recognise him. No longer wearing the vivid blue of the senior space cadet, he was now dressed in black trousers fitting snugly around the legs, a midnight blue pullover jersey, and the black billed hat of the merchant spaceman. His once close-cropped blonde hair was beginning to grow shaggy around the edges, and with the hat pulled low over his forehead, he might have been another person entirely. Leaving the space station on the jetliner had been easy for Roger, since no one suspected he would violate his trust. But once his absence was discovered and the warrant issued for his arrest, it had been necessary for him to assume some sort of disguise to elude the Solar Guard MPs. Roger had wound up on Spaceman's row in Venusport, as a matter of course. Luckily, when he left the station, he had the foresight to take all his money with him, so he was not yet in need. On Spaceman's row, Roger found the new freedom from discipline enjoyable at first, but now the novelty had worn off. Having visited all of the interesting places on the row, existence there had become boring. His one attempt to leave Spaceman's row had nearly met with disaster. Running into a squad of Solar Guard MPs, he had made a hurried escape into a nearby jet taxi. Back on the row, Roger had lounged around the cafes, feeling the loneliness that haunts men wanted by the law. And only because he was so lonely, he had agreed to talk to the little man who sat and stared at him from across the table. You a rocket pusher, astrogator or skipper? Asked the little man. Who wants to know? Asked Roger cautiously. Look, sonny boy. Was the quick retort. I'm Mr Shinny. I'm the fixer of Spaceman's Row. You want something? Come to me and I'll get it for you. I don't care why you're here. That ain't none of my business. But the fact remains that you're here and you don't come down here unless you're in trouble, space deep. Roger looked at the little man more closely. Suppose I am in something deep. What could you do for me? He asked. What would you want done? Asked Shinny slyly. Well, said Roger casually. I could use a set of papers. What happens to your own? Solar Guard picked them up. Answered Roger simply. For what? Asked Shinny. Taking ice cream away from the skipper's pet monkey. Snapped Roger. Shinny threw back his head and laughed. That's good. Very good. He wiped his mouth after spitting at a nearby cuspidor. He reached over and patted Roger on the arm. You'll do, Sonny. You'll do right well on the row. Join me in a little acceleration sport? What's that? Asked Roger. Rocket juice, said Shinny. Ain't you never heard of rocket juice? I've heard about it, said Roger with a smile. And I'm still here to talk about it because I never drank any of it. Roger liked the little man for some reason. He couldn't tell why. He'd met several people on the road since his arrival, but they had all wanted to know how many credits he had and where he was staying. I took a jolt of that stuff once in Luna City, said Roger. I was ready to blast off without a rocket ship. Shinny laughed again. Good lad. Well, you won't mind if I have just a little one. He paused and wiped his lips. On you, of course. One. Roger held up his finger. On me, of course. Hey there, yelled Shinny. You, with the asteroid head. Give me a short bucket of that juice, and bring a bottle of Martian Fizz along with it. The bartender nodded, and Shinny turned back to Roger. Martian Fizz is nothing more than a little water with sugar in it, he explained. Yeah, I know, replied Roger. What about those papers? I'll talk to you, spaceman to spaceman, said Shinny, when you're ready to talk to me, spaceman to spaceman. They were silent while the bartender slopped a glass full of bluish liquid in front of Shinny and the bottle of Martian fizz and a glass in front of Roger. Roger paid for the drinks and poured a glass of the mild sweet water. Sipping it silently, he suddenly put the glass down again and looked Shinny in the eye. You know who I am, he stated quietly. Yep, replied Shinny. You're Roger Manning, Space Cadet. 
breach of honour and violation of the spaceman's oath, escaped from the Venus space station on a jet liner, but one of the best men on a radar scanner and astrogation prism in the whole alliance. Shinny related the information rapidly. He had known all the time, thought Roger. He was testing me. Roger wondered why. What are you going to do about it? Questioned Roger, thinking about the 1,000 credit reward, standard price offered by the Solar Guard for all wanted men. If I had wanted to, I could have brought the finest jetliner in space with money made on Solar Guard rewards. Snap Shinny. We got our own spaceman's code here on the row. It goes something like this. What a man wants to bring with him down here, he brings. What he don't bring, don't exist. Roger smiled and stuck out his hand. All right, Mr Shinny. I want a set of papers, space papers, made out in any name so that I can get out into space again. I don't care where I go or on what or how long I'm gone. I just got a blast off. You want papers for the astrogation deck or control or as a power pusher? Asked Shinny. Roger thought for a moment. Better make them for the control deck, he said. Credits, said Shinny. You have any credits? How much? Asked Roger. One hundred now, said Shinny. And then added, And one hundred when I deliver. Guaranteed papers? Positively, snorted Shinny. I don't sell things that ain't good. I'm an honest man. Roger reached inside his jersey and pulled out a small roll of crumpled credit notes. He counted off one hundred and handed them over to Shinny. When do I get the papers? Asked Roger. Tomorrow. Same place, same time. Answered Shinny. What's the name of this place? Asked Roger. Café Cosmos. Roger picked up his glass of sweet water, raising it in a toast to the little man in front of him. Until tomorrow, Mr Shinny, when you come back here with the papers, or I come looking for you with bare knuckles. You don't scare me, snapped Shinny. I'll be here. Roger tilted his chair back and smiled his casual smile. I know you'll be back, Mr Shinny. You see, I really mean what I say. And more important, you know I mean what I say. Shinny got up. Tomorrow. Same time, same place, he said, hurrying out the door. Roger finished the bottle of Martian fizz, suddenly very depressed. He didn't really want the false papers, he just wanted to get away from the deadly humdrum existence on Spaceman's Row. He walked wearily back to his scrubby little bedroom to wait for the night to come. He hated to go back to the room, because he knew he would think about Tom and Astro and the Space Academy. Now he couldn't allow himself to think about it anymore. It was past. Finished. You got who? asked Loring. I said I got the best astrogator in the deep for you, snapped Shinny. Loring looked at Mason and then suddenly burst out laughing, dropping his head on the table. What's the matter with you? demanded Shinny. You got space fever or something? Mason, sitting quietly in the dirty hotel room, was grinning from ear to ear. So you got Manning for us, eh? repeated Loring at last. I want to tell you something, Shinny. I was the one that got that kid to break out of that space station. You what? asked Shinny. The little spaceman had come to like the straightforwardness of Roger. That's right, said Loring. When Mason and me loused up taking over the Annie Jones, that kid Manning was on the radar watch at the station. At the same time we were going to crash into the station, he crossed a couple of wires and was talking to his girl back on Earth. They think he fouled up the radar and caused the crash. Then he's your fool guy, commented Shinny thoughtfully. Right, said Loring. And now you come along and tell us that we can get him to astrogate us out of Tara. I tell you, Mason, this is the greatest gag I've heard in years. Yeah, agreed Mason, his weak mouth still stretched in a stupid grin. But you have to be careful he never finds out it was us that got him into all this trouble. Leave that to me, said Loring. He'll never know a thing. In fact, he'll thank us for getting him off the station and then giving him a chance to get back in space. He turned to Shinny. You got this ship? I told you before, said Shinny. There ain't anything to be had. Well, we gotta have a ship, said Loring. A fortune waiting for us in the deep and no space wagon to go get it. There is a ship, said Shinny. Not too good, but a spaceship. Where? asked Loring. Near Venusport. Out in the jungles, to be exact. Needs a little fixing, but it'll make a deep space hop well enough. Who does it belong to? demanded Loring. Me, said Shinny, a strange twinkle in his eyes. You? gasped Loring. By the craters of Luna, where did you get a spaceship? Fifteen years ago a freighter was forced down in the jungles, right near Venusport, said Shinny. I was prospecting nearby for pitch blend, back when everybody thought Venus was loaded with it. I saw the crew leave in jet boats. Soon as they was out of sight, 
I went over to take a look. I wanted to see if there was any grub I could swipe, and save myself a trip back to Venusport for more supplies. Anyway, I went aboard and found the grub all right, but I got nosy about why they'd made an emergency touchdown. I looked around the power deck, found they'd busted their reaction timer. I got the idea then of fixing it up and bringing it back to Venusport to give them young jerks a surprise. I lifted her off the ground and then figured, why oh, should I give it back? Just move it someplace else and let the vines and creepers grow over it for a few days. Didn't the crew come back looking for it? Asked Loring. Did they? Chortle Chinny. I'll say they did. Almost drove them poor fellows crazy. I guess they searched for that old wagon for three months before giving up. And, and you mean it's still there? And in good condition? Asked Loring. Needs a little fuel. Said Chinny. And probably a good overhaul. But I don't think there's anything serious the matter with it. By the craters of Luna! Exclaimed Loring. We'll blast off immediately! Hold on. Said Chinny. I didn't say I'd give it to you. Well, what do you want for it? Demanded Loring. Ah, let me see. Mused Chinny. I figure that if you figure to get as much as twenty million credits out of the copper, a full quarter share ought to be about right. Five million credits for a ship that's been rotting in the jungle for fifteen years? Exclaimed Loring. She's in good shape, defended Chinny. I go out there every six months or so and turn over the reactors just to keep them from getting rusty. Why didn't you try to do something with it before? Asked Loring. Never had no occasion to, answered Chinny. Well, is it a deal or isn't it? Too much, snapped Loring. That's my price, said Chinny. I could take the ship and not give you anything, sneered Loring. If the Solar Guard looked for three months in that jungle with a hundred men and instruments, do you think you'll find it? I'll give you a fifth share, said Loring. Nope, said Chinny. I've known my price. You either take it or leave it. He glared at Loring. Mason finally spoke. Take it, Loring, he said. And let's get out of here. I'm getting jittery over the investigation that's coming up on the station. All right, said Loring. It's a deal. One quarter share for the ship. Done, said Chinny. Now, I guess we'd better go talk to that boy Manning, eh? Don't you think it's a little dangerous taking him along? Whined Mason. Yeah, maybe you're right, said Loring. If it was me, said Chinny, I wouldn't give it a second thought. You're going into deep space. It ain't like a hop to Mars or Titan. This is as deep as you can go. If I was you, I'd want the best there is in my crew. And from what I've heard about that young fella, he's the best there is on the radar bridge. You know who his father was? Who? Asked Mason. Ken. Shinny suddenly closed his mouth tight. Just another spaceman. He said. But a good one. He rose quickly. Well, I'm supposed to meet Manning in an hour at the Cosmos. The three men left the dingy hotel and walked out into the main street of Spaceman's Row. In a few moments, they arrived at the Café Cosmos. Roger was already there, seated at the same table and watching the door. When he saw Loring and Mason with Shinny, he eyed them warily. Hiya, kid, greeted Loring. Glad to see you took my advice and got away from Blastoff Connell. Mason waved a salute and the three men sat down. Roger ignored Loring and Mason, speaking directly to Shinny. Did you complete our deal? He asked softly. No, nope. answered Shinny. I brought you another one instead. Roger held out his hand. My 100 credits. Now. Never mind the credits, kid, said Loring. We've got more important things to talk about. Roger continued to look at Shinny, his palm outstretched on the top of the table. 100 credits, he repeated coldly. Reluctantly, Shinny handed over the money. Slowly, carefully, Roger counted the bills. And then, after putting them away, he turned to face Loring for the first time. You said you have something important to discuss with me? He drawled. I see you learned fast, kid, said Loring with a crooked smile. I wouldn't trust Shinny as far as I could throw a comet. Mason laughed loudly. The other three men glared at him, and he stopped abruptly. Here's the proposition, Manning, said Loring, leaning across the table. I've got a ship. And I want to make a hop into deep space. I want you to do the astrogation. I'm interested, said Roger. Keep talking. Briefly, Loring described the copper satellite, its potential value, and what they expected to get out of it. Roger listened without comment. When Loring had finished, Shinny told him about the ship and its condition. When Shinny finished, Loring turned to Roger. Well, Manning, he asked. How do you like the setup? How much do I get out of it? asked Roger. 
One twentieth of the deck, said Loring. There are four of us. One full quarter share, nothing less, drawled Roger. One fourth to Shinny and one fourth to him, whined Mason. That only leaves us a fourth apiece. That's more than you've got now, snapped Loring. All right, Manning, you're in. Roger smiled for the first time. When do we blast off? As soon as we get that space wagon in shape, we hit the deep, said Loring. I think I need a drink on that, said Shinny. He yelled for the bartender, who brought rocket juice and Martian fizz. Roger picked up the glass of the sweet water and glanced around the table. What's the name of the space wagon you've got buried in the jungles, Mr Shinny? Ain't got no name, said Shinny. Roger paused, a slight smile playing at the corners of his mouth. Then I propose we name her after the hearts of each of us here at the table. What's that? asked Loring. Space Devil, said Roger. Shinny grinned, his frail body trembling slightly from his silent laughter. He held up the glass of rocket juice. I propose a toast to the Space Devil. To, to the, the Space, space devil, devil, said the others together. And whatever trouble she brings, added Roger softly. End of chapter 10